He was full of energy. So we would buy him cars and action figures and he'd just kind of look at them. He wanted to he'd throw them away, put them back in his toy box and come and find us to go play ball. So really had little interest in, in traditional toys. Andrew Armstrong grew up as rambunctious as they come. In his early years, Jim Armstrong made sure he never missed a minute of the action. It was the highlight of my day. So when I got to that ball field, I could have the worst day at work, get to the ball field and everything went away, all my headaches, and I was ecstatic to be there. Andrew's affection for athletics began at a young age, and it was baseball that gave him the butterflies. I always wanted to be a professional baseball player, and I, that's all I did up to my fifth grade. I started basketball, and I, I just played basketball so I could get conditioned for baseball. All the conditioning paid off as a teenager. At Cardinal Mooney High School in Youngstown, Ohio, Armstrong scored 20 points per game as a 6'2 power forward. And in the spring, he set the single season school record with a .81 ERA as a pitcher. We just were certain that he was gonna be a Division I baseball player, and then he found uh, football and fell in love with the game, and, and everything kind of changed. What the Armstrongs didn't know is if it would be changed for the better. But Andrew quickly put those questions to bed. High school football is one of the greatest, the greatest times of my life. Despite having just three years of playing experience, Andrew received 12 offers from Division I football programs. He chose Syracuse University, where he's in line to take over next season for Zaire Franklin, one of the best linebackers in the ACC. I envision myself starting, um, becoming an all-ACC all linebacker, uh, you know, winning ACC championship, and hopefully being able to go to the NFL one day. That's my ultimate goal and dream. At SU, Armstrong is poised for success, but back in high school, he believed his college career was over before it ever began. I would hydrate, eat healthy, and I just, just not feel right. I feel sluggish and tired. December 2013, Andrew's junior year. Jim began to notice changes in his son's behavior. I started um, urinating a ton throughout the night, like four or five times getting up and going to the bathroom. And my dad noticed, noticed that, and he was like, that's not right. Concerned for their son, the Armstrongs paid a visit to the doctors. Once all the results came back, they, they put him in an ambulance during an ice storm, and uh, Don and I had to follow the ambulance about a 45 minute drive to Akron, Ohio, um, and then we were there for three days. That night, Andrew's life changed forever. He entered the Akron Children's Hospital with his blood sugar levels four times higher than average. He was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at the age of 16. It was a complete shock. I really had no idea what type 1 diabetes was before I got it. When I look at Andrew, I still see my little boy, <laughs> you know. So of course as a mom, I want to protect him. But you know, when he got diagnosed, I guess the main thing is just we were there for him and he knew we loved him. Really didn't register at first what, and I thought it's got to be a mistake, and it was just completely shocking to us. You have an organ, an internal organ, it's called your pancreas. Your pancreas secretes insulin. Okay, so for you, your pancreas, when anytime you have sugar that you ingest, your pancreas takes care of that. For type one, we, we kind of don't get that opportunity. Tim Pike understands the struggles Andrew has faced since his diagnosis. Pike has type 1 diabetes as well. It is a, a dangerous thing and they can pass out, they can do things. But even beyond that, you got to take ownership of this. Nearly 30 million Americans have diabetes, but less than one and a half million have type 1. While in many cases, type 2 can be resolved with diet and exercise, type 1 is genetic with no known cure. Faced with this reality, Andrew had only two thoughts. One, could I play sports still? And the second was, I'm fortunate that this isn't, this isn't a more serious disease like cancer. It took us months, actually, to kind of get over the initial shock. And uh, it was a constant worry for us. We were afraid we'd hurt him or he'd hurt himself with needles. On the flip side, Andrew handled it very well and he wasn't remotely worried about it. Doctors told the Armstrongs Andrew could still play sports under the condition that he carefully monitored his blood sugar. Initially, that concept was difficult to wrap his mind around. I was kind of upset, like, because I was like, yo, I can't eat pizza no more or, or cake. And they're like, well, you can, but you just got to take insulin. 
But since then, Andrews managed his diabetes rather impeccably, almost as if he had picked up another sport. You know, I realized that this was something I'm gonna have to deal with for the rest of my life unless they find a cure. Uh, I accepted th that and I understood that this is just, it's gonna be part of my life now and I can't dwell on it, I gotta get over it and you know, you know, make the most out of it. It's a part of his life that's given Andrew purpose. His diabetes is a divine commission, one he's committed not to waste. I think I was diagnosed for a reason. I think God diagnosed me to inspire other, other kids with type one that, you know, if they follow their dreams and work hard, they can still accomplish what they want to do even with this disease. No matter what he does, he's going to be a successful kid because he just doesn't allow circumstances to dictate who he is and how he's going to do things. You know, he just is not a product of that. Watching him grow up and seeing the man that he's become, um, he's so kind and generous and has a great sense of humor, smart, strong, everything. He's turning into a wonderful person. It's just astounding and how well he's, he's been, he's accepted this, this challenge in his life. Uh, Don and I say all the time, he's, we're, we're extremely proud of him um, and he's our, he's, he, he motivates us. A purpose that extends beyond the end zone. A purpose worthy of pursuit. Chris Venzen, ACC Extra. It's game time here at Liverpool High School, which means Ryan Blackwell has just settled into his comfort zone. In just his second year as head coach, Blackwell has his Warriors ranked number four in all of New York. The team's noticeable chemistry flows from its head coach's confident, easygoing demeanor. But on Blackwell's team, if you don't perform... He'll give you that look. He'll give you that stare down. What do you yeah. mean? What's that? Like, he'll just <laughs> stare you down, yeah. And what does that mean? Start, better start playing. Wrap around, you'll be wide open. Coach Blackwell learned how to dish out the tough love in Japan as a player and coach for the Sendai 89ers. Blackwell spent 10 years playing overseas after starting for three seasons at Syracuse University in the late 90s. I want somebody to push me and I want to know that they're in my corner. Good job, good job. It's this type of support that's changed the lives of his players. Just helped my attitude get better on and off the court and the type of support he wishes he had overseas. I kind of, I guess maybe, didn't take it as serious as I used to when I was younger. So I was like, well, either I'm gonna go into the corporate world, and do something back home, or get into coaching. I think that was a great decision on my part. Now Blackwell's found a home where he can have an even bigger impact off a court than he could ever have on one. I enjoy basketball, obviously, I enjoy sports, but I enjoy mentoring these kids, um, especially these kids at this age. Are, they're emotional. Um, they have a lot, a lot of things going on, and, and it's a crazy world out there, and just trying to steer them in the right direction is great. Chris Venzen, NCC News. It's Rip. As a little kid, you kind of need something to burn off the energy and stuff over the course of the day. So uh, my wife wants to put them into dance classes and we walk through. There we go. Uh, luckily we saw the guy Scott that happens to own the skate park and he goes, oh we give lessons at four years old. And I was like, he's not dancing. Trick shot. Jackson Cudick is your average nine-year-old. He likes sugary energy drinks and he loves chocolate cookies. Triple chunk, chunk chocolate. He likes jokes, but he's not funny. <laughs> Cartoons, Teen Titans. But most of all, Jackson likes skateboarding. You get to have fun and you get to learn new tricks. And sometimes they look awesome. Really awesome. But not every trick goes according to plan. And sometimes hopping back on the board after a tough fall can be scary. But that's where dad comes in. Like he told me, don't cry, just say, ouch. That's kind of what I told him. Like, hey, you could either do it or not do it, but it's a lot cooler if you do it. <laughs> As you can probably tell, a big spill never yeah. kept Jackson down for long. I do this every single day. 
Jackson is so good, he regularly places in national competitions with skaters sometimes twice his age. But for Jackson, this is only the beginning. I want to be a pro skateboarder. That's my dream when I grow up. And, and I want to be the best of the best. <laughs> it's a dream a watchful father is happy to support. I don't know where his whole drive comes from. It's something I wish I had. I don't have the drive and focus that he does. Thank you. Chris Venzen, Citrus TV. Jackson's rise to stardom in the skateboarding community is rare. If he goes pro, he'll be the only active professional skateboarder from Syracuse. Your Citrus TV Sports Report. Welcome back. I'm Chris Venzen. 364 days ago, Syracuse lacrosse had just finished wiping the floor with the lowly Cornell Big Red. The final in that one, an uncompetitive 15-8 to in favor of the Orange. This year, though, things are a little different. Cornell enters tonight's 7 o'clock matchup with Cuse, ranked 11th in the country with the top scoring offense in the nation and an excellent defense to boot. Fans should expect a very different game this time around, and head coach John Desco knows he can't overlook the Big Reds' rapid rise to relevance. But even, even in their losses, you know, you got a two-goal loss to Albany, and Albany, I think, won almost all the face-offs in that game, so for them to be that close with Albany when Albany had so many possessions, that says a lot. Uh, we scrimmaged Yale early in the year. We know how good they are. They're, you know, one of the top teams in the country. That was a two-goal loss, uh, so... They're, they're playing well when they get the ball, they, especially with T. I think their, uh, their percentages are pretty good. We're joined now by Jonah Karp, Citrus TV reporter, covering the game at Cornell from Ithaca. Jonah, thanks for joining us. I'll, I'll start you off with this. A casual fan might not instantly recognize some of the players on Cornell's roster. Who should we keep an eye on tonight? Well, Chris, I have to say Jeff T. He's only a sophomore, but he leads the nation in points per game, averaging about six and a half points per game this year. That's outstanding, and he's really he's really the anchor of what is a high-powered offense of Cornell. And just to put into perspective how good this guy is, Jeff T. is he has 65 points on the year. The next highest scorer on Cornell has just 36. That's how good this guy is. He's priority number one if you're Syracuse. So then, if you're John Desco in the Syracuse Orange, how do you stop Jeff T? Well, Nick Mellon's the guy you, uh, you need to look out for. If you're the Syracuse defense, he's the guy that's going to be stopping Jeff T, presumably. Because we've seen, this, we've seen this movie before, quite honestly, down in Duke. Just a couple weeks back, Nick Mellon held Justin Gutterding, who at the time was the nation's top scorer, to just one goal and earned him ACC Defensive Player of the Week honors. So look for him to be the biggest factor for the Syracuse defense in stopping this guy, Jeff T. All right, so Jonah, before we let you off the hook tonight, what's your prediction? Who's coming out on top? I have to say my prediction is 12-11 Syracuse. It's poised to be a close game akin to the Duke game a couple weeks back. This is a Syracuse defense that's played remarkably well over the last couple games, held Hobart to four goals, held Notre Dame to six goals. The last two games, just 10 goals combined for the opposition. A Syracuse defense that struggled most of the year, a Cornell offense that is averaged over 15 goals a game, which is one of just two schools. So. It's supposed to be a close one. I think Syracuse pulls out the victory, albeit it's going to be a tight one. All right, there you have it. Jo Syracuse and Cornell from Ithaca and Cornell at 7 o'clock this evening. Jonah, thank you so much for your time. We always appreciate you. All right, elsewhere, Syracuse track and field opened the season on a high note with a school record smashing 10K performance from Paige Stoner. This week, though, it was the men's turn to rewrite the record books. The 400-meter men's relay team of Matt Moore, Kashif Miller, Angelo Goss, and Winston Lee crossed the finish line in, get this, 40.22 seconds. That's one-tenth of a second faster than the previous school record set in 1995. Even more impressive, the team couldn't practice outdoors all of last week because of the snowy weather, so their entire practice and training schedule leading up to the event was disrupted. That's absolutely remarkable. Okay, big recruiting news elsewhere for an SU basketball team that could really use a little bit of good news. A former Pitt Panther recruit Bryce Golden has decommitted from Pittsburgh and has listed Syracuse as one of his final six schools that he's interested in playing for next year. 24-7 Sports has Golden listed as a 6'9", three-star power forward. 
His commitment would bolster a suddenly slim depth chart for at the forward position for SU with both Matthew Moyer and recruit Darius Baisley, you'll remember, choosing to play elsewhere next season. In the MLB, the New York Yankees and the Boston Red Sox square off from Fenway for the first time this year in just a little under an hour. Both teams' sky-high hopes for their seasons have slightly tapered off as of late. New York's young, talented bats have really struggled to find themselves early in the season, but the Bombers, they do send out their best pitcher in Luis Severino this evening. Meanwhile, the Sox are off to the best start in their 117-year history, if you can believe that. But the red-hot Xander Bogarts hits the DL with an injured ankle and will not play tonight. Two teams that have playoff aspirations. I know I'm sure you'll catch the game. Huge Yankees oh, yes. fan. Oh, definitely. It's and definitely going to be exciting. Big time until I get to see the Yankees in the playoffs. But NBA and uh, NHL playoffs, uh, you know, coming up. It's that time of year. What can we expect from New York teams there? Uh, New Jersey Devils, they have a game on Thursday at 7 o'clock against the Tampa Bay Lightning. They haven't lost to the Lightning this entire season. And for basketball, uh, the Knicks and the Nets both missed the playoffs. They join L.A., the Lakers, and the Clippers. There has never been a team since 1976 where there's been a season where the Lakers, the Clippers, the Nets, and the Knicks all missed the playoffs at the same time. So no representation from the biggest cities in the United States. Thanks, Chris.